Welcome to the Agile Wire, where professional scrum trainers Jeff Bubbles and Jeff Molesky discuss agile topics. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Bubbles and Jeff Molesky. And we are recording. All right, Mr. Boobles, kick us off, man. All right. We have uh, Drunk Agile combining forces with us today. So we got Daniel and Pradeek. And they were just about ready to jump down Jeff's throat. So I'm just going to kick it right back to Jeff to ask that question one more time. Have him walk into the danger zone here. So, All right. Awesome. So um, I'll, I'll do a little bit of plug here. So I was going back and watching uh, a number of your earlier episodes and kind of taking some notes on uh, a lot of the topics that you guys were, were both covering and one of them was specifically around story points. And I, I think we can, we can all agree that there's uh, a better way of uh, doing things with story points, especially when we're thinking about predictability and forecasting. But one of the interesting things that you had thrown out there in that discussion was, um, you know, it's, it's about the, the conversation is what is important when we're talking about story points. And you had said there are better ways of doing that. And I, and I was just kind of curious, okay, well, what, what are those better ways then of having the conversation um, around story points or around the complexity and alignment when using story points? Okay. Yeah, me, me. He's, Dan's pointing to me. Uh, there, there, there are obviously multiple ways. The, our favorite one is looking at work item age and as things age, figure out what's going wrong with this. Um, but before we get to that, let's dial it back. What is that conversation that we're trying to have? The conversation we're trying to have is figure out if this work item is indeed only one work item or multiple work items, and we all have some idea of how we're going to approach solving the problem this thing represents. That That's the conversation we want to have. And while well, story points are a way to do that, uh, looking at your service level expectation of how long it gets to, to, it takes to get things done and then over time uh, as you learn more about it when you work on it re revisiting that conversation every time something pops up some some new information pops so up. one of the requirements then to have work item age is that you actually have to work on it and so that means you have to start it without getting an estimate is that what we're, t what we're saying here it's essentially, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Essentially, yeah. So, um, yeah, for me, for me, Pratik said the 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 key thing, um, and that's the, the the R word, right sizing. You know, before before you start on something, the only thing, as far as we're concerned, <laughs> the only thing that you need you need to know, and you don't even know this, um, is uh, is this thing right sized or not? You know, I I don't care if it's a one. I don't care if it's a 20, I don't know, I don't know, you know, I don't even know story points, you know, when they, they kind of, they kind of abandoned the Fibonacci sequence at some point, and then it's like, you know, 13, 20, 100, you know, or something like that. So it's, it's really, anyway, um, the only thing that we really care about is, you know, it, it, is it right sized? If we have general consensus, that thing is right sized conversations over, you know, let's, let's, let's start working on it. Um, there, there, there's this concept of particular, I talk a lot of, uh, about a lot. Um, and that's this idea of, uh, ex ante knowledge versus ex post knowledge, um, and so many times we assume we have this knowledge about, and if, if we can talk about, if we just talk about this story more, we'll we'll learn a lot about complexity. We'll learn a lot about how long it will take to get done. And the thing is, yeah. the more you talk about it, you, you're really not you're not driving out uncertainty at that point. You're just wasting time. Yep. And so I guess my, I don't know if concern is 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 the right word with that, but one work item age, if I'm under standing it correctly, is inherently a lagging indicator, like to, to what Jeff was just saying. Like we have to get started working on it before we can start to understand how long it's going to take us. And so when I am in environments where we're thinking about using story points, to me, the, it, it's, it's whose line is it anyway? The, the scores are made up and the points don't matter, right? I don't care about the points for any type of estimation of work sizing or forecasting. I care about the the the, the 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 point sizing, just to make sure that we're on the same page with one another. So, as I was saying before, okay, great, you know, somebody throws out the magical eight, another team member throws out the magical two, and okay, it sounds like there's probably a disconnect somewhere inside of this item. Are we aligned on why we're doing this, what the goals are, what it is that we actually need to build, and how we are likely going to solve the, this, this problem, like those those three decent questions to, to be talking through. And if the answer to that question is yes, 
and I just think it's going to take longer, or yes, and I think it's going to take a less amount of time, screw it. Like we're done with the conversation. We've gotten to the the, the more important piece, which was just an alignment and common understanding. Now work item age and measuring the actuals will actually help us figure out um, with, with, with forecasting and projection into the future. So when you say there are better ways, is it the there are better ways of getting to that upfront alignment and or we don't need that upfront alignment by doing the actual work, we will get to the alignment. To me, the answer is both. <laughs> we don't need asset, <laughs> yeah, we, we need directional alignment. We don't need to know the exact route we're going to take to get to the destination. Uh, we need an idea of, is this thing way too big for our system? So like, for example, an eight, I'm going to use story point terms. Uh, let's say we as a team have a contract or an agreement that we're not going to work on anything above a five in, in story point world. So anytime someone says eight, oh, let's break this thing up so that they're smaller and, and, and we, it is right size for our system. Now, Dan and I prefer the, the language of let's look at our data, how long it takes us. We usually get things running 10 days or less, so let's right size it to 10. Can we at least agree that this thing is 10 days or less? We're directionally aligned. Now beyond that, as we make progress on it, we're going to find out what is the exact path to get to that place. Yeah, my 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 fundamental, well, I've got so many fundamental problems with story points, but my fundamental problem with story points is, you know, uh, I, I really don't like the whole, oh, yeah, but the conversation is great. I don't care about the points, but the conversation is great is because they, the story points comes with all this other baggage. You know, somebody somewhere is going to turn a story point into a date. Somebody somewhere is going to do that. You know, and uh, Pratik and I were talking about this. I don't, I don't know what the human bias is, but there, there is some human bias that, like, if you know something's ninety nine percent bad, but potentially one percent good, people are afraid to throw it out because they're like, oh, we're going to miss the one percent. Oh, well, if we throw so it out, so you're saying there's a chance. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and so yes, can can story points foster a better conversation? Yes, I don't think any of us are really gonna are, are really gonna debate that. But it's all the other baggage that comes with it. And so that's why we, when we say better, that's why we like talking about right-sizing in terms of an SLE because, number one, it's hopefully grounded in data on our system. And then, number two, it's going to be based on some expectation of what the, the customer is going to see in terms of how long it takes because somebody somewhere is going to turn this thing into, into a forecast. Yeah, um, and and that forecast so is based I, off. I would of, not open up Pandora's box. Sorry, Jeff. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, and then I think the root caused it is the forecast is based off of expert opinion or team opinion instead of off of some type of data, right? And we all know how emotional those conversations can get when we're talking about when something will get done. So like, it just leads down a path that's just it's gonna probably get abused. And because it gets abused, it leads to other patterns of work breakdown structure. And I think that's where the root, where my biggest problem is, or that I see, is that, well, now we, we put story points on, we call these things PBIs that are now more task-based. They're more the testing, the analysis, the API work, the something else, right? The integration, instead of the value that you're delivering. So I would even push back even further on a team and say, well, you know, they say we can't get this thing done um, you know, in 10 days, that's our 85 percentile. Let's just say they're, they're looking at their SLEs. And I'd say, cool, okay, what would it take to get it done within 10 days if you don't think, you know, well, we can't have one person work on it. That would be a puzzle. Great, don't have one person work on it. Have two people work on it. Have a whole team work on it. That'd be what I would suggest, right? Too often I find it's like one person going off and working on it, and that's what they're basing all the estimates off of instead of like a team actually teaming around something to provide value. So, um, I don't know. I, I'm more on the same side as yours, but don't break it down past the value or past the point of value would be what I'd recommend to a team. Like I always keep the value and then try to show something that's, I don't know, show some type of value and maybe you prove out feasibility. Can we even build this thing? What does it actually look like? There's some other thing you can prove out. It doesn't have to be the value that the customer or the user you, you know gets from it. So I guess... Man, I don't, I don't want to be stubborn with this because it's not like I, I honestly don't even like using story points either. But even in what you were articulating there, Jeff, was 
I, I really want to deconstruct this down into two pieces. One is we're going to use story points for forecasting purposes. And I'm pretty sure like all of us are in agreement. Like that's a shitty thing. Don't do that. Like it's, it's not going to end well, right? Like totally agree. But then there's the, the conversation of let's use story points to just help us understand and scope, right? Like to help us answer the question. And, and we're probably asking the same thing just differently. Dan, you're saying, can this be accomplished within the next 10 days? Cool, that, that's in line with our SLE. Or we've got a team that says, we typically can get 10 story points done every sprint. Is this thing bigger than 10 story points, right? Like, we're, I feel like we're asking the same question. We're just using different tools to get to it. And, and hence, like, now we're at a tools level discussion, which, like, I don't like those types of discussions. But if it's serving the purpose of right sizing, and it is just for us understanding complexity to a certain degree, just to get started. Like that's where I'm like, who cares? Like if it's story points or SLE, great. We're not using it for any of the negative things. We're just trying to have the right conversations around it. Right. And, and I guess that, I, I, I totally agree with that. And I guess the, like I said, is, is where does it, after the story point conversation is done, where, where do we go from there? And, and, you know, I think you're kind of making an assumption now, okay, the story point conversation is done. We're throwing out the story points. What I'm saying is when the right sizing conversation is done, you're not throwing out right sizing. In fact, that's just the beginning of the conversation. You keep it going. That's why we say, look at, look at work item aging. You, you keep that conversation going every single day. Um, about you know uh, about aging, so you don't have to throw that stuff out. So that's I guess to me that's that's it's like it's you're right. I think the starting point is exactly the same. Where where it ends up is is completely different, in my in my opinion. Yeah, it's it's uh, to yeah. add to that. It's um, I'm trying to think of a good example, and I cannot. It's uh, it's like using using a, a a knife to clip your nails versus using a nail clipper to clip your nails you're most likely going to end up clipping your nails, but it's a lot more dangerous because a knife can be used for a lot worse things and you can cut yourself using the knife. Meanwhile, if, so if, we're, if we're ending up doing the exact same thing, shut up, Dan. If you're ending up doing the exact same thing, <laughs> why not use something that's safer and does not, and, and no pun intended with safe, uh, and, and, and not likely to, to cause more harm? How, how, how do we remove the things that can potentially cause harm. Okay, so I, I, I'm on board with that. And I think this might be an interesting segue. So let me set it up because in the past, when I have worked with teams, um, one is like, I would step in as the product owner role. And, and to me, when we're thinking about refinement, I've always viewed that as that's a product led discussion. Like I'm the one who's bringing the thing that I want to have built to the team. And it's my job to properly convey uh, the information. And so um, one of the first things that I do when I'm setting up uh, working with a team is I establish a definition of ready with the team. And I say, here is the contract that I'm setting up with the team. I've been an engineer in the past and I just think of it more like a gentleman's agreement, right? Like if some person were to come to me and say, Jeff, I want you to do something or I want you to build something. Here's some basic information that I would like to know before I actually jump in and get started with it. And so it would be like, who is this for? What is the problem that we're trying to solve? What is it that we want to do? Um, some given when then acceptance criteria to go along with it. And um, I, we would set up to say, is this, if this was the next most important thing on the backlog, if this was the next thing that this team needed to pull in and get started, do you feel comfortable getting started working on it? Is there enough information there for you to get started? And um, if so, then we're calling it refined. It is ready to go. It's ready to be brought in or pulled in and, and work executed on it. If it's not, then there is more um, refinement that we need to do as a team to get it ready to be worked on. And that was kind of our gentleman's agreement with our definition of ready. And one of the ways that we knew that, that it would, had been refined, was we attached an estimate to it, right? Like we threw that story point number on it. That means, hey, we know enough about this thing that we're comfortable sizing it to some degree. Dan, in, in your language, maybe it's, yep, we think this is accomplishable within a sprint and we are ready to rock and roll. So that was our, our lightweight 
definition of ready um, for how we would typically set it up with teams. Now, I, I'd be kind of curious, Dan, because you, you had mentioned this earlier, like, man, what's going on with the definition of ready? Um, you know, it didn't seem like you had some thoughts on it. So what what were you thinking? Well, I, think, I was thinking, it's like every time I bring up definition of ready in a, in a scrum setting, it's like people pull out their pitchforks and their torches and they're sprinkling holy, throwing holy water at me, right? And their metals, uh, their wooden stakes and everything. It's like, uh, you know, and I, it, it seemed it's, the idea of definition of done is good, but definition of ready is bad is so completely incon- incongruous to me. I cannot, I cannot get my head around that, you know, the, the ad, advocating for a definition of done. But when somebody introduces definition of ready, people just, just freak out and say, no, this is evil. This is terrible. Why, why would you ever do that? that? That was the question I was asking. It's like, I do, I do fundamentally do not understand that. If you think definition of done is good, for, especially when we're talking about predictability and forecasting, definition of ready is a thousand times more important than done. You know, it's like, it's like when you start something and how you start something is the much bigger contributor to predictability than done is. Um, so that, anyway, that, that was the question I, I wanted to explore because I just, I just do not understand that mindset. I don't get it. Help, help me. Somebody help me, please. I think that the pushback that some people may have in the Agile community is that we've seen the definition of ready turn into a phase gate. And so with the, it's almost like a sign-off that you have to have, and it pushes us back into the waterfall days. And so if it becomes something where I'm the product owner and I wake up in the morning and I'm taking a shower and I have a brilliant idea and I want to reach, I want to change the order of the backlog before we're ready to start planning something for that next sprint. Or let's just say we're ready to pull some things in and I want to pull something in a different order that we haven't refined and it's going to, I want to get it through a couple columns maybe in our workflow, but I want to do it right now because that's the most important thing. And you say, you can't do that because we had, we have this definition already here and you can't, you don't meet all these requirements. I think that might be a problem. You know, um, especially like if the product, are, like one thing's on there you can't satisfy, and it, but it's the most important thing to do. Like if we all know it is, then just do it. You know, so I think that's that's where the problem lies. Is like it shouldn't be something that stops us from working on the most valuable thing to be working on. Isn't definition of done a phase gate? Um, I think it's just more something to give us clarity than anything else. I don't know. Do you think it's a phase gate? I mean, I think it just says we need to do these things to have a common understanding of what done is. I, I think you, you could do the same thing about, to have a common understanding of what ready is. Yeah. 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 And it's just saying, let's have that focus right now to get to ready. So I like, think let's have this focus right now to get to done. If that's the most important thing to get in increments, we can ship something. Let's, I don't see them being that different. It just, in some organizations, I think the way they use them is it's a longer period of time to get something to ready. And so you can't get something ready in a sprint planning. That's not what we do. We do that in refinement. You got to wait till next week. Well, that's not the spirit of what you're trying to get after. Right? Like, and so that's that. I think that's where the pushback comes from. It's like you can get to ready whenever you need to, and if you, if you, say you can only... uh, assuming you have space under your whip limit, right? That's sure, sure, <laughs> sure. That's fair. So, so I'll get into this. So I think that's the main problem with story points is that a lot of times I don't think people actually use them for anything. If what they're intended to be used for is a whip limit. They're a capacity gauge for the people doing the work to say we can only take on this much work. But they don't get used that often because it's like, well, as a product owner, I really love to get this thing in. Can't you guys just do a little bit more? And then they end up with a lot more than they than they thought they could. The whip limits are higher. We see slower deliveries. And so, like, they're not really being used the way they were intended to be used. You know? So I guess when people are using story points, I always ask the question, like, what is um what are you gonna do with that? Like, what decisions will you make? whether you have it or don't have it. If this thing's an eight or is it a one, are you going to do it either way, product owner? Yes. Okay. Well, then does it matter? <laughs> Why are we spending the time debating that, you know? I'm going to say something that is a little bit anti-scrum here. I'm hoping that's <laughs> not a huge issue. But I believe the real problem is that the product owner is too specialized a role. Hmm. We okay, tre- tell, tell us more about that. We are treating product owners as something separate from the team that only the product handler has to make sure that definition of ready is met. And that's why it starts feeling like a phase gate in the middle of getting work done. To me, yes, um, product owner is a separate role. They, they, they just, there are certain decisions that someone has to make, but even what happens to the left of ready should have some sort of involvement from everyone 
And once you start doing that, then what you end up doing, at least in, in my world, is you start expanding the Kanban board. And now this is a part of the process. The definition of ready, what used to be definition of ready, is now just an exit criteria on one of the columns that says this stuff has to happen before mm -hmm. it moves forward. Um, I don't. Yeah, really so you're, you're maybe suggesting more of a shared ownership on getting that work to ready yeah. instead of like, and some teams they might put it more on the product owner. It's like your core responsibility. Yeah, and then now our definition of ready. I don't think that's an anti scrum thing. I think that's just a good practice. I, oh, I think that's. I'm glad I'm glad, I'm glad I'm not. Hey, out, of, out of curiosity. Sorry. Uh, out of curiosity, just because, um, Dan, what you, what you had thrown out there was the, the whole phase gating question. Um, and it might be semantics or it might be literally the same thing, but I'm curious, you guys are all smarter than me. Would Is the state in a con, in your Kanban board, is that synonymous with like moving from to do to doing? Is that literally a phase gate? It's a, it's a porous phase gate. <laughs> uh, the way... I'll go, what, so what do you mean by yeah, that? Yeah, I'll go a little deep into how I like to explain this is, let's say you have these five columns on your board, whatever that is. And each of them has these exit criteria. Things need to happen here before something can move forward. Things need to happen here. You have to, to me, there are always exit criteria. Things need to happen here before something can move forward. But something from a future phase or something from a future state can always happen earlier. So here's a list of requirements that need to be fulfilled before I can say this has left column A and gone to column B. But requirements for column B can already be uh, start getting fulfilled in column A. So yes, it's a phase gate, but it's not a hard phase gate because you can do future stuff already. Yeah, yeah the, I, I would say the expectation is something that moves out of the column, an expectation is that it ain't ever coming back. That's the expectation. Now, what, can it come back? Absolutely, it can. But the expectation is if it leaves that column, it should not be coming back. Um, so I don't know if you call that a phase gate. Gotcha. And, I, and again, I was just kind of going back to Dan, your, your comment about, well, is the definition, why is the definition of done not a phase gate, but, you know, the definition of ready is a phase gate to Jeff's answer of like, okay, well, that's why we have shied away from it potentially as, as part of the agile community. I think Jeff is being a little bit more polite there. I feel like just Jeff Molesky's perception, a scrum folk tend to be a little bit more dogmatic. And because the definition of ready is not f called out as an artifact or a commitment in the same way that the definition of done is called out as a commitment with your sprint, or excuse me, the, the increment inside of the scrum guide, because Ken and Jeff have spoken, therefore it is not, you know, a, a thing that we are going to go after. Um, I just cards on the table. I tend to go towards, I think the definition of ready is awesome. Uh, I think we should have transparency and alignment around before we get started with work, we should have some baseline understanding of what this thing is, just like I was articulating earlier. I really just think that that's good things. Now, to Jeff's point, if I'm the product manager, or the product owner, and I'm taking a shower in the morning, I'm like, wow, shit, what we should really do is this thing over here. Fantastic. The way I had articulated is ideally we have these conversations before we get started. But if we didn't already have the conversation, and I'm asking the team to do it, well, then the first thing that we're going to do is have the conversation around what that thing is. And so we're we're going to do it either way. So like, I, I, well, I don't know. I feel like we hem and haw over something that's not really important. Well, are, are we going to do it though? Because this is where my question is, and I don't want to get too much into the, um, you know, um, mechanics of, of, of Scrum, but it's, it's, it's something that I always, I've never really quite understood. Um, if, the, if the product owner has a shower in the morning and says, ah, I've got this great idea. And let's say that it's, it's coincidentally that great idea is on sprint planning day, you know? So we're getting together and product owner puts that thing at the, 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 the top of the, the product backlog. Number one, there's no guarantee that that thing gets selected for the sprint, right? And then number two, even if it does get selected for the sprint, there's no guarantee that the develop the, the developers on the team will even pull it into the sprint. And then number three, even if they do pull it into the sprint, there's no guarantee that it's going to get get finished. Do you, well, do you see what I'm saying? I mean, so, I mean, maybe like somebody, if they, somebody, if they carried somebody. everything over and they said, we're at capacity, we're not pulling anything new in, then nothing would get pulled in. But the proctor says, the next thing you pull in, I want to be this number one thing that I said is ready to go. Can't developers say no? I, when, so what? No. I know that's your number one. That's I'm not. I'm, we're not going to do that. 
It's the highest valuable be. thing. So then they have to negotiate, be like, well, we could do one or we could do number three, four, and five. Which one would you rather have a stew product owner? And then they like, I still want one. It's my number one. Can we get that done? And they're like, okay, well, I guess we'll pull it in. Even if it's too big, they might be like, I don't think we're going to be able to get it done. They're like, I know we got to start on it. You know, I really That's think not, we got to work on that. That's not okay. That's not the way that I understand how it, how it works. But okay. Cause that, that, that was the thing that was, that was confusing me is, um, you know, I mean, what's the point of the product owner if they don't? Ha- and what's the point of an ordered backlog if you're not going to pull from the top? You're going to work on lower value work. If- we need to come back and have that conversation because we do not believe in ordered backlogs <laughs> and we do not believe in product owners. <laughs> so, so, but you do that in everyday work, right? Like you got a honey to do list, right? Your your wife comes to you and you says, "Hey, I I want all these things done, Dan, this weekend." What do you do? You probably put them in some type of list. You probably order them. You probably pick one to start on. You limit your whip. You do limit your yeah, whip. I, yeah, I mean, yeah. I'll, I'll <laughs> but, but I don't. I don't do a list. I don't do an ordering. I don't do. I pick one, and when I'm done with that, I go. I'm like, okay, what's the next one? Okay, what's the next one? We spend no time. Let's 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 talk about. Okay, now trimming the bushes. All right, let's let's talk. What's our definition of of ready for trimming the bushes, and what's our definition of done for? You, you know what I mean? There, there's not. Bad. So yeah, but it does. This does kind of fall apart. Like trimming the bushes is not complex work, right? Like it's not a. Shit, what's the term where there's a, a wicked problem, uh, where there's m- multiple potential solutions to the problem? Well, whatever, okay? <laughs> like, that, that's a simple thats yeah. a simple problem. And yes, you don't need to, to go to that extremity. But I, I understand what, what, what you're saying there. But like, even in what you just said, you said, oh, I trimmed the bushes and I go back and I, and I ask, okay, well, what's, what's the next most important? Like, okay, well, somebody is making an ordering decision. That person likely has a list, whether it's just in their head or it's in, God forbid, Jira or some <laughs> other tool or whatever. But like somewhere that ordered list exists. But, yeah, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. But <laughs> that next one that we talk about might be number 13 on the list. Do you see what I'm saying? I, tr- I trimmed the bushes. And when I trimmed the bushes, I found an inf- inf- uh, infestation of wasps. Not that this has never happened, ever happened or whatever, you know? And guess what? That infestation, getting rid of the infestation of wasps was never on the list, right? But we decided, okay, now this is the most important thing to do. We would have spent all that time ordering that list. And now this this new thing came up and it's like, oh, but that's the most important thing to do. Well, yeah, but I think that's just like a normal scrum team having a policy when it's like when you find something that's like meets this criteria, we just do it when we so have a, you know, the next bill. So why order? Because you can plan, you can order stuff for the planned work, but then when on plan stuff up, you adjust, right? Like that's, that's it's what you do. It's always going to be unplanned. It's always going to be unplanned. But that's like, Okay. So, so let, let me push back on that because I, I don't think that's generally the case um, it, for, for better or worse. I'm not saying this is right or this is wrong, but from a business perspective, I still need to know, like, what are we planning on putting towards this quarter? Like, why am I giving your team money? What can I expect that to, to be delivered over the next quarter? Yeah, I, certainly there's going to be unexpected things that pop up, but you're still likely having a business objective that you are moving towards. Oh, your retention numbers, you're working on that. Oh, your monthly active users, you're working on that. Oh, your NPS, you're trying to improve that. Like, what is your goal that you are moving towards? Oh, man, you guys are just eating this up. You're like, these <laughs> novices I love, over I love, here. I love, I love when people give me this is because... Uh, sorry, Pratik, I'm going to I'm going to crowd you out, <laughs> but you, you you but you jump in. Uh, so not 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 that this is you know hundred million dollar company or whatever or, you know billions of dollars. It's certainly not you know um, FTX uh, you know crypto exchange or anything like that. But I I built Actionable Agile totally 100% self funded, 100% self funded, and I never ever asked those questions. I never needed to know, hey, what are we doing in the next month? What are we doing in the next quarter? What are we doing in the next year? It was always every day, have a conversation with the development team. What do we think we should work on today? They'd go work on it. Usually we we right sized our stuff to be between two and three days. They'd come back in two days when that thing was done and I saw it and I learned about what was going on. Then I was like, okay, here's the next thing. I never had an ordered list. I never had a goal. I never had, I never had any of these things. It was always just in time always was pretty much 100% just in time. Um, and like I said, I'm not saying that, that this can be done in every business situation. But for me, I w- I'd much rather see us moving more toward that more toward a just in time solution, rather than, 
you know, an upfront planning. This is the whole ex ante, ex post thing. I'd much rather respond to to known information rather than speculate about stuff we don't know. Pratik, you talk. Yeah, I, I've I, talked too much. I'll, I'll, I'll do. I'll do by example stuff. Up. Um, probably the most successful uh, management revolution in the past 150 years was Toyota production system, and it's all based on just in time. Um, all, almost every business out there probably right now has an ordered list. They probably have an ordered list. And what is the percentage of businesses that actually succeed? It's, it's probably pretty low. So this, there, somehow we have figured out that a great management way of doing things is just in time, but we're not really doing it. We're asking people to keep ordered lists. Hmm. And to me, I think I, I guess my 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 pushback, I guess, would be that I've seen a lot of people get emotional about decisions of what they should work on next, and they don't follow the strategy, and so they work on the very urgent things instead of the things that are the most important. So you'll always work on the urgent things. I was working with a startup client recently, and we had it was like support tickets coming in. We gotta have to have great support. We gotta keep this company going, keep our customers, all this stuff. And guess what? They got no new features done because everybody would rally on the bugs and issues that came in instead of, which was great for the customers. They got their stuff fixed fast, but they never got anything new out. So they weren't getting new customers. And that's not a good long-term solution. So they had to figure out different ways to, to incorporate, you know, being more strategic about their time and, and not losing so much to context switching and things like that. So, I think that that's a very hard, difficult thing to do if you don't have an order list and somebody that can stand back and be like, yep, this all makes sense. Here's a theme. We're going to deliver this. We're going to work on this problem. Yep, but we still have to do this operational stuff. And they kind of figure out a balance. And I don't. I think we go way, way too far in the organizations. I agree with you. Like We go, we plan years instead of planning the next, Like I don't think we have to go that far. I think if we can get even the next month or two or three months, that'd be most maybe, that would be great. But we do multiple years worth of stuff inside a list. That's probably way, way, way too much. But is there something in the middle there where like there is some value to having things in a ranked list and be able to look back at that strategically and say, like, are we working on the right things? Do we have the right plan? And it's not so much the plan, it's the planning that makes that adds the value. We're almost back to the story point conversation here. <laughs> we're almost, we've, come, we've come the full circle to, it's not the story points, it's the conversation. It's not the plan, it's the planning. We've almost come a full circle there. So for, for Dan, for your, um, the way you were talking about how you built um, Actionable Agile, I, I, I'm just assuming, uh, and you can correct me if the assumption is incorrect, um, but you, you had some idea of the problem you were looking to solve. Um, and you were just incrementally going along and being very adaptive to what you thought the next thing you wanted to build. Is, is that a fair assumption? I had to admit, for the first week, yes. For the first week of my development with Action by Agile, yes, that is true. After that okay. and how I quickly, I quickly figured out how wrong I was, it's mm -hmm. like, I'm not wasting my time on that because I was learning okay. so much. So, but yeah. <laughs> For the first week, All right. <laughs> and and I want to be careful. Like I I don't want to argue for the sake of arguing because I by and large agree with what you were saying. Like when I was the last time I was a product manager, yes, I was asked to build a roadmap for the next twelve months. It was a, a an annual roadmap, but only the next quarter was defined with the things that I was looking to build. Beyond that, it was more of the objectives that I was trying to achieve. So it was what and why, but not how. Um, and that's typically where I want to keep it. But also then, Pratik, to, to, to your example, you, you talked about Toyota production system. I think that makes sense, but they weren't just, I again, assumptions. I've never worked at Toyota, but I don't think they were just ran, not random's not the word, right word, but like flying by the seat of their pants on uh, every three days, deciding what's the new thing we're going to build into this car. Like they had already figured that out ahead of time. And you, you even used the word production, right? They were just building the thing at that point, which, okay, that, that makes more sense, but you still have the strategic goal out there. And by, if you want to use like Amazon's think big, start small or working backwards uh, type of mindset there, like you understand what the end state is looking like and you're just incrementally getting to that point, right? Through, through smaller releases. I, I guess what I'm trying to get to as, as I'm vocalizing this 
is I see merit on both sides of it. I don't I don't think it's a, a, a binary do it this way or do it that way. I would agree, like, let's, our organizations are probably way too far on the let's plan all the details out and simply execute the plan versus inspecting and adapting or more just in time to decide what we want to work out and the value that we are we are looking to deliver. Can, can I suggest, and this, this sounds like we're ganging up on Scrum, and believe me, trust me, people out there who are listening, if you're listening, if you're still listening, I'm, I'm not against Scrum. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. But, you know, having studied it now for, for several years, you know, there are just so, so, so many inconsistencies in the framework. It's driving me nuts. I think Scrum institutionalizes, Jeff, what you're, what you're talking about. Because you think, think about this. Think about this. Um, per sprint, let's talk about all the planning events per sprint. How much time does the Scrum Guide allocate for planning events? Let's say we're doing a one-month sprint. How much, how much time does the Scrum Guide say that you can spend on all the planning events? So like sprint sprint planning is, is, is eight hours, and then you do a daily Scrum every 15, for 15 minutes every day. Or, and those are maxes, right? So that's yeah, the yeah. maximum amount of time you could spend. You, so let's, let's assume that we, that we take the max. Let's just assume. How much does it, how much does it allocate for review? for the review events? Four hours. And then three hours for the retro, so seven. So even seven hours. So even Scrum, I think, is heavyweight on planning. You know, you know and it institutionalizes this idea that planning is more important than review. Planning is more important than responding. That, I, it, it makes no sense to me. It makes absolutely no sense to me. Yeah, I think when so, they started but, it, they didn't have they didn't even have refinement. So they didn't have a way that they were getting the work ready. And so a lot of that happened in sprint planning. And because that was happening in planning, you were just getting the work ready and then starting to do it, you know? Yeah. And they found it to be very painful in a lot of organizations because they didn't have skill sets, they didn't have knowledge, they had dependencies, whatever it might be. Yeah. And so then they'd have to go find those things. They wouldn't, couldn't work on the thing that was most valuable or strategic for the organization. So they said, hey, let's do this refinement thing, get the work ready, have, I mean, almost really what we're talking about here is trying to visualize that flow of the work to getting it ready. And then let's let's work on it. And now many teams can plan much, much quicker than that, right? Yeah. But that's a very big window when you plan a month, right? Like, and so what a lot of teams keep finding is it's much easier to plan shorter distances or shorter time frames. So they keep going shorter and shorter and shorter. And I don't know, we used to be just months, in time, <laughs> which I think is where they're going, right? Yeah. But like, think about where they were before this. Like, you think of like organizations back in the '90s planning a whole year mm -hmm. in advance. Yeah. And two, even two now, years, there's a lot years, of organizations yeah. that can't get away from planning like a safe implement, like a PI, where it's a quarter at a time. So that's still better than before. And if we can get to two weeks and now one week, well, maybe we are going to just in time. But like, I think a lot of people have to have to work towards that and get comfortable with that, you know. And there's other things inside of the organization that have to be in place to allow that to happen. Um, so many organizations we walk into and, and they're way over capacity and they're not willing to change that. And so if you're not willing to change that, we can't get the knowledge we need. So we can't work on the things that are the most important. So like these things compound on each other. So until we solve some of the real problems, like we're working on way too much stuff inside the organizational level, not just at this one team level, um, I think you're going to struggle to do it without some type of forward looking planning. And so that's like the band aid solution that people are using right now. So that, that two to one number, I'm, I'm kind of curious uh, about it. Even in a, a flow environment, would what I was trying to think through was, wouldn't we likely be spending more time up front, like two units of time to one unit of time, figuring out, making sure we understand what we want to build to reviewing what it is that we built? It just, it, why do you think it would be reversed? I, I think this is why this is why Dan and I started the conversation with aging, because for us that every day that something has happened that might make, take this thing off course is a review activity, and and hmm. every day that something's happened that that we get things done get done things done in ten days or less. This thing is already at five days. Half of our stuff was probably done by now. Let's say that's the case. What's happening here that should, let's review this and figure out where we go from here. We're, we are taking a bunch of those things that would happen in sprint planning and kind of sprinkling it throughout the process. Uh, but we're looking at it from this just happened, what did we learn from it perspective, rather than 
we're looking at this thing and going, what can happen with this and what can go wrong and how big is this now? So we're taking a lot of the, uh, Dan mentioned the ex post versus ex ante thing. We're taking a lot of stuff from, from one side of it and putting it on the other side. Sure. So in that, in that conversation though, um, if I can oversimplify it, what I heard was we're, we're learning from a execution standpoint. Why is this thing taking as long as it's going to take? But that's when I think of sprint review, that's really not at all what I want to be talking about at a sprint review. I want to be talking about what is the feedback of this done thing, right? Like sit around with it, play with it. I want some feedback. Is it accomplishing the goal? Is life better now that you have this thing? Um, and so that, that's where I was wondering the whole upfront planning versus the review, regardless of framework, be ag- agnostic to this. If there's a thing we have to get done and then there's some time that we're going to spend reviewing it, I would expect that we're likely going to spend more time to your point, Pratik, like not just before we get started, as we're working on it, figuring out what's going on. And then at the end, did it, did it solve the problem? On the review side. Once it's done. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Well, and that's, that's what I was going to say. I mean, that's why I would, for for me, eight hours seems way too, even if we're talking about one month sprint, seems way too much. If you can't get sprint done, sprint planning done in an hour, if you can't get it done, honestly, in 10 minutes, you're spending way, 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 especially in the era of having tools of like Monte Carlo simulation and things like that. You're spending way, way too much. For, for, for my money, the review, the sprint review is the most important event in Scrum, right? If somebody, if somebody put a gun to my head and say, Dan, pick the most important event in Scrum, to me, it would be the, the it would be the review. It's very, very close second is the retro. But um, for, for me, I, I, might, I might even dump planning all, altogether. Um, but, but so I, so I think, so I, I guess what I'm saying is I, I do think the review should be kind of two to one. It should be, you know, it, uh, we should be talking to our customers. We should be learning. Pratik has this thing. Most people think that the, the done column on a Kanban board means, is, especially if you're doing software, oh, you've put your code into production. That's that's done. Um, actually, no. Done, done is, you know, there's probably at least one, maybe two steps after done. You know, did we validate it was useful to the customer? If it was not valid, or, you know, if it was not useful, did we pull that out of the code base? You know, did did we did we get mm-hmm. rid of that feature? Right there, there's there's all kinds of other stuff that needs to be done as in terms of action on on that feedback. So, but your um, planning still, God, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse. Here. <laughs> but your planning does still happen in a flow environment, though. It's more that you're you're not doing it in one eight hour upfront block. You're doing it just in time as you are pulling the work in to be executed on. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. True. I just, so I just yeah. got oh, okay. yeah, I just got something done. Yeah, it's just, What's the next most important thing? It's just I think yeah. the balance is there's a lot less emphasis on planning and I would argue a lot more emphasis on the on the review. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. But every time you do a review, aren't you inspecting what you just did and then adapting that and coming up with a plan of what you're going to do next? Like Yep, right? yep, so you're yep, kind of yep. just like again, accelerating that feedback loop into smaller chunks, right? The, yes. the planning is just in time and the review is just in time. I mean, that's, that's yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. So I think, I don't know, maybe this is something to dive into. Like, what is your perception of what happens at a sprint planning? Like, what? Tell, it sounds like more like, oh, are we doing just doing story points and like doing refinement? Or are we, what are we doing? Because let me tell you a couple stories about different teams that I've worked with that do planning. Because it might sound different than what you're, you're thinking of here. Just correct me if I'm wrong. So I had one team where, um, so they figure out, okay, we're pulling this work in. We're going to start it. Hey, what does this interface actually look like? There's different screens we're going to be building. And so everybody paper prototypes what they think it's going to look like. We already had know what the other screens look like. They draw out the things, we compare everybody's examples, we pull everybody's best ideas up, we come up with, yep, it's gonna look like something like this. The person is strong in UX says, yep, all right, I'm gonna make these artifacts. Where are you guys starting? Yep, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna create this front end, but I'll put your stuff in here. All right, I'll start on the back end. I'm gonna do this. Okay, I'll go create the database. I got these fields, this is what I'm gonna need. Okay, yep, ready to go, yep, break. Like that's, that's sprint planning. So it's more like, I mean, they're planning the work and then they're just doing it, but like they're doing it on paper first, so they have a visual. So that they can actually get to that plan. Okay, so that's one way. One way. Another thing can be like, hey, we have a very complex legacy system. There's a lot going on here, and so they might go ahead and say, these are all the things that need to be done. 
who's going to work on them when, and what part of this architecture are we actually going to be working on them? And they look at it and be like, oh, wait, Pradeek and Dan are going to be in the same service at the same time in the middle of the sprint. That's not going to work out well. They're going to be stepping on each other's toes. How do we move that to one person or different timing and still not affect everybody else's plan? So they're like coordinating and then like assimilating. And then we inspect and adapt that every day because things change, right? But like, at least they come up with a high level plan of like how we think we can like do this most effectively as a team. So those are things that I see teams doing, and it's not a scrum master or a product owner leading it. It's the teams figuring out how they're going to work best together and coming up with the details, that how. Because they need to come up with the how, and as teams get more and more comfortable with each other, they can do less and less of the how and just kind of do it you know, as they go and, and work through it. Um, but I think a lot of teams, a lot of developers that I've worked with are very used to more traditional ways, and so like this, is, this helps them get comfortable with what they're going to do over the next period of time, the next sprint. I know. Is that what your perception of sprint planning is, or did I talk about something to, well, different? Uh, I can I, I can t- I can tell you how I think sprint planning should be. And I, um, full, full disclosure: I've never been on a proper scrum team, right? I, I just haven't. So, but this is this is how I, if it were me, this is how I would run run sprint planning. Um, this is some some other deficiencies in scrum, though. I think I I think a product owner should be a, I think it should be actually a person. With positional power, I think a scrum master should also be a person with positional power. That's a, maybe that's another 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 conversation, um, so, some other time. But I would love to see the product owner show up um, for sprint planning. Say this is going to be our goal. Now, probably there should be some in, in, input from the developers in terms of you know what's technically feasible or not. But for the most part, I would love to see the product owner say this is for the next two weeks. This is what we're going to be focusing on. Developers run a Monte Carlo simulation and say, okay, this is your here's here's your budget. Here's a budget of PBIs that we think mm-hmm. we can get done in the next. We are going to come to you just in time. And you tell us which of those PBIs, because this is going to be your budget. You know, your product owner, you need to go now figure out what you think those PBIs are that are going to meet that yeah. goal. We'll come to you just in time. And you tell us what's the next most important thing. What's the next most important thing? Conversations over in 10 minutes. Because we're not, we're not selecting the exact PBIs for the sprint. We're not doing any refinement in the sprint. We're not doing any prototyping. We're not doing any of that. What's our goal? What's our budget? Let's go. That's how, that's how I and then how do you get going though? Because like, how do we work together as a team if we don't know what the play is? It's like going on and saying, okay, let's run, go run that play. Let's go get that touchdown. We have no play. The play is what's, we have whip limits. <laughs> go score a touchdown. Yeah. That's the play. <laughs> I don't know. The play, is, <laughs> the play is we have whip limits. Well, this is the other thing. I'm assuming you're doing Kanban, right? So, how, you know, how much capacity do we have? Okay. You know, we have, we have capacity to start two BBIs. Product owner, what are the two most, what are the two most important PBIs that help us get to that goal? Yeah, that's that, that. That's I think the only difference for me from from Jeff what you described. What you described was he, here is the you described one instance. Here is the one thing we're going to work on. What I see people doing is they're talking about the next ten things they're going to work on and doing that same level on each of those. As we talked about, which play we'll run, they never talk about what are the next ten plays we'll run. They talk about what right. is the play we'll run right now. That's a just in time. Mm-hmm. We run a play. We figured out what the defense is doing. Okay, now let's figure out what's the next play to run. Just in time. This thing is done. What's next? That's how I envision any kind of planning. What's the most important thing for all of us to focus on right now? Let's do that. Once that's done, what's the next thing to do? So, so Scrum experts is what I described. Is that Scrum? Is that with that? I, I would think that would be allowed in Scrum. What I just said. I would think that that would be allowed. Is that? Um, sure. It'd be allowed. I think what would happen, though, is we we might have put a structure in place where people are going to work a lot, much more as individuals than as a team, because they don't know how to work together. We haven't set that up like the play that I was talking about with Perdique. So all this stuff works great for selecting the work we think we're going to do, come with the forecast, here's your budget. Yep, we, we're on the same page. We're aligned product owner and team. But now how do I, as a team member use my skills to help provide the value? And how does Jeff use his skills to help provide the value? And how do we do that? on the, the initiative we're trying to do right now. Like we need to plan that at some point or at least come up with what we're, each of us are going to move forward on. Like right now we're going to go do something. And if I, if my first thing leaving a sprint planning meeting is that I need to go have a meeting with Jeff to figure out how we're going to work together on, on our shared goal of like this business case or whatever the goal is that we're trying to do, then we didn't accomplish what we needed to accomplish in sprint planning. Like we should have a plan of like what we're going to do and not need to meet. Like we should go start working after sprint planning. Hmm. You're looking at me confused, Dan. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. We, we we maybe need to do a whole, like I said, maybe a whole other episode on that because I think we've kind of we kind of kind of got off the rails. But I don't I don't know why you can't have that by pulling PBIs in 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 just in time. Why you can't do that? 
Oh, sure. You could. You could. You just got to have a mini planning then of like, well, how are we working on this one and figure out your game plan? Like yeah. a call to play, basically, uh, is what I'm saying. I'll, I'll, I'll give, yeah. you, uh, I'll give yeah. you an example of how I've yeah. done it in the past. Uh, whenever we had the next most important thing to pull, the three or four of us who were going to work on this thing, who were who had freed up from finishing the previous thing, would get together, spend 10 yep. minutes. Do we all understand this? How are we going to go about it? Great. Let's get started. That, that, that just... So, not sprint planning, but story planning. As sure. soon as I put this thing in, let me figure out what we need to do about it. Let's get it going. When we're done with this, next thing. What are we, what are we going to do about this? Let's get it going. Yep. I like it. I like story planning. That's actually, that's good. It's like story planning in, in a much smaller batches, right? That's always a good, a good sign, I think. Smaller we batches it, working. We used to call it a story kickoff. But yeah, exactly. That's so that's that's very similar to um, when I was at Health Champion with Weber. Like that's that's how we did our sprint planning. Was it essentially was a ten to fifteen minute meeting, which was, hey, here are the the five to seven things that we think we're we're, we're going to do this sprint. Hey, are there any last minute questions about this stuff that we've got the whole team together? Let's just answer any questions that we might have, and if not, cool. Then that's our plan. And then as these items are pulled in, great. If there are more questions that come up to what you you two have been saying this whole time, that's the time at which we're going to dig deeper on these things without the potential to waste seven, eight, 12 people's time all in one big upfront meeting at the beginning. That likely is going to give us a false sense of security that we've got all the questions answered and we just need to execute to the plan. Good. So Scrum is better than Kanban. I'm glad we've come to that. <laughs> I, I think what we've proved, I think what we've proved is you need both. I think that's yeah. what, I think yeah. that's what this is. I'm totally know. messing with you guys. Yes, yeah. of course. Of course. And I yeah. think that yeah. we've, we've uh, maybe come all the way around to say that the spirit of both is the same, right? Like they both are trying to accomplish the same goal. Yeah. So yeah. the more you can uh, shrink your feedback loops, your batches, the more you can learn about when things are aging and try to make predictability decisions sooner, the better, right? Like, I think we could all agree on that. The, yeah. The, um, the way that we've said it a few times in the past is as quickly as possible, find out how wrong you are. That's what, that's what both of these are trying to do. Let's figure out how wrong we are as quickly as possible. I, I do not envy how you guys are going to uh, edit this episode. This is going to be. <laughs> this is going to be. This is going to be a lot of fun for you. I know. But if we can, if we can bring it back to the the original thing, because uh, I was thinking about this, is uh, th I think it's it's silly for it's silly for Dan to have the final word on story points on something like story points. So that's why I always go back to the person who invented story points, and you know he's on the record. How many times has he come on the record saying, "I invented story points. Don't use them. I invented story points. Don't use them." He's he said it. I think. 10 times, maybe 20 times on Twitter. To, to me, that's the final word. If the person who invented them says they're not a good idea, why are we still having the debate? Uh, that, 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 that makes no sense to me. So, mm -hmm. so I, I realize that I am likely the exception to the rule. And Dan, you, you, you had mentioned this. But literally, I use the story points for the conversation, and then I throw them away. I, I, I use the Monte Carlo forecasting tool. We're looking at actuals of what we've what we've been able to get done sprint over sprint and i apply those moving forward for me it's literally about the conversation um and generally it's just for that alignment that i'm going after so and i guess the last thing i'll say on it is like we were just talking through all of us have different experiences working with different teams and we, we've got something in our head, right? When we're, somebody says story points, we are imagining the situation where the team spent five fucking hours debating whether this thing was a three or a five, okay? Like, I get it. If the conversation has gone on for more than five to 10 minutes, we are spending too long on it and it is no longer valid. Like, let's just start building and that will tell us how big the thing actually is. So, like, I do have guardrails in place when I use these things, but... I, I guess I'm kind of deferring to you guys where like, yeah, I do lean to more just in time, but I do find value in having something there to help but elicit a little bit of conversation up front, whether that's in refinement, whether that's in planning or whether that's just in time when we're getting ready to start working on something. Let's just make sure that we're aligned with this thing and whatever tool 
works well for us and it's not a waste of time and we're not doing it just because somebody said use story points or don't use story points cool if there's value to it let's use it if there's no value to it let's let's not keep it okay i just shut down the conversation <laughs> excellent <laughs> All right, guys, thanks for coming on, on the podcast. Is there anything at this time you guys want to plug? Just start. I mean, we're, we already plugged our Drunk Agile channel. So that's, that's drunk, drunk. if you haven't checked out the Drunk Agile channel, check that out. If you, um, if you haven't heard of ProCombine.org, come, come check us out, too, if you want, want to learn a little bit more about some of these flow things we've been talking about. Come on, you get some new books, too. Talk about those. Ish, right? You contributed on some? Oh, you're talking about the, the Kanban pocket guide and the Yeah, the Kanban flow? pocket guide. There was another one too. Oh, yeah. Flow flow metrics so for scrum flow, teams. Yeah. yeah, that yeah, one. Yeah. yeah. Kanban we did those. guide and flow metrics. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Excellent salesmanship yeah. here, guys. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Agile Wire. We are consistently inspecting and adapting ourselves. We would appreciate feedback at feedback at theagilewire.com or on iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play Store. See you next time.